50 years ago, with a vision to expand the educational opportunities in the City of Lights, Clark County Community College was born. Over the past five decades, it has grown to be the largest and most diverse institution of higher learning in the state of Nevada. Now known as the College of Southern Nevada, CSN continues to create opportunities and change lives, and with a legacy of serving the Southern Nevada community. We embark on the dawn of our second 50 years with an eye on looking ahead and aiming higher, transforming our community through workforce education, diversity, and innovation. The College of Southern Nevada, 50 years strong. Good afternoon and welcome to this month's President's Town Hall. My name is Brian Borgon, Director of Communications and Training at CSN. As always, we have a lot of great information for you today, and we certainly hope that you will find it useful. Today's panel, in addition to Dr. Saragossa, consists of Mary Kay Bailey, Vice President of Finance and Administration, Juanita Christenthal, Vice President for Student Affairs, James McCoy, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Magunt Vaitilingam, Chief Information Officer, Patty Charlton, Campus Vice President and Provost for the Henderson Campus, Clarissa Coda, Campus Vice President and Provost for the North Las Vegas Campus, and Dr. Bill Dial, Chief Human Resources Officer. Looking ahead to our next town hall for faculty and staff, it will be, I'm sorry, if you have any questions for today's town hall, remember to use the Q&A module denoted by the question mark icon in your team's toolbar to submit your questions. We will begin taking your questions right before the Q&A portion of today's program. And now, looking ahead to our next town hall for faculty and staff, it will be held on Thursday, September 30th, at 2 p.m. Be sure to join us then for more important updates. I would now like to present to you your CSN president, Dr. Federico Saragossa. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon and welcome all. As always, I hope that you and your family and your loved ones are in good health and in good spirits. As the first order of business, I want to thank all of you that joined us for our fall 2021 50th anniversary convocation this past Monday. I hope that you found the sessions productive, informative, and entertaining. <laughs> I especially want to thank all of the members of the convocation committee, all of the CSN family and church governance partners that participated, and the hard work of our events and production teams under Magunth Vitilingam and Michelle Ward. And of course, my appreciation to Chief of Staff and Diversity Officer Lawrence Weekly for his exceptional performance moderating the convocation. Thank you all for making our Fall 2021 convocation such a success. This afternoon, I will be brief in my remarks because we want to get to the formal presentations and the Q&A portion of this town hall as soon as possible. As you know, much has happened since the last time we met just a few weeks ago, uh, we were talking about the changing environment and entering of a new era in the COVID uh, pandemic uh, discussions, and that's exactly what I've got to report today. First, the Pfizer vaccine has now received FDA approval. The Nevada Board of Health approved mandatory vaccines for all NCHI institution students prior to enrollment for the spring 2022 semester and the Board of Regents will be deliberating on whether to require vaccines for all NCHI employees. So there's a lot going on and we have a lot of information to share with you at this town hall. So without further ado, I will turn the program over to Patty and our CSN panel to be followed by question and answers and also your engagement in this panel. So thank you, Patty, and it's all yours. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Zaragoza, and good afternoon to all of our CSN family. I'm gonna take just a couple of moments and private provide a little bit more detail around some of the announcements that Dr. Zaragoza just provided to us. Next slide, please. 
So as Dr. Zaragoza mentioned that the State Board of Health recently took action to make a, a COVID-19 vaccination requirement mandatory for students. We do want to make sure that we reinforce for all of our CSM family. This does not pertain to the fall of 2021 semester. And so many have asked questions about the November 1st date, and I'm going to talk about that just a little bit more in detail, but it will not impact any of the fall classes or any fall enrollments for students. So that action was taken on August the 20th and it revises the Nevada Administrative Code section 441A.755. And what that did is to expand the mandatory vaccination section to include all NC students, including CSN, where previously it was only pertaining to university students. This does pertain to those individuals that need to provide a proof of vaccination by November 1st and that is um, the date has been identified as that is typically on or about when the spring 22 semester um, uh, schedule and registration will begin. And that proof of vaccination does need to be consistent with a fully vaccinated person. And so as Dr. Zaragoza also mentioned, we were excited to learn that on Monday of this week on August the 23rd, that the FDA gave full approval for the Pfizer vaccination, and we know that Moderna is also in that process. Those are two dose vaccinations, and so a student would have to um, have both doses completed uh, by that November 1st date. So we are going to encourage people to, to go through that process sooner than later to, so that they can make sure to have the appropriate gaps in those two doses, either 21 to 28 days. Or it can also be satisfied by the single dose of the J&J &J vaccine. And for community colleges, and I know this has been a question, is the, the Nevada Administrative Code also does include other types of vaccinations for students at the universities, such as measles, mumps, rubella, tetanus, and diphtheria. That does not uh, pertain to the community college students. Um, we also want to be specific that if there are other specific programmatic uh, requirements, such for, as for our allied health students, those are still going to be in place for those within those programs. Now, there are certain exemptions that um, do accompany that Nevada Administrative Code, and one of those does include a student that is enrolled fully in a remote course or in distance education courses. But what does need to be um, considered is if a, if a class has any portion of the course that will require an in-person instruction, a lab, an internship or externship, any student teaching or any of the learning or research activities that may occur between a student and their instruction in person, instructor in person, that is not an exemption. But a student that takes a class fully remote or through distance education would not have to have the vaccine and proof of vaccination. There are also um, considerations for religious beliefs and our NC general counsel, as well as our student affairs team and our registrar's office are working on updating the current forms and reviewing those for any inconsistency that may need to be applied and to update those appropriately. And then this, the third and final exemption does relate to those with the doc documented medical condition. And under the NAC, it does require a student to have a documented medical condition that would preclude them from taking the vaccine. And that would also include, and there is a form for this as well, that would include a statement from a licensed physician. And again, the NC General Counsels in concert with our Registrar's Office and Student Affairs are working through those forms to update them appropriately. The second announcement that Dr. Zaragoza also shared with you is that the September meeting of the Board of Regents, they will be discussing and may take action to provide an authorization to draft emergency policy amendments to require a COVID-19 vaccination for all of the NC employees. So during that process, they will look at the emergency amendments, if it, if it does pass, that would have to be implemented, and that would include reference within the, Nevada, the, the Board of Regents Code, the handbook, and what we call the P&G, or the Procedures and Guidelines Manual. And this would to include any implementation and enforcement of such a mandate, including but not limited to this is academic and administrative faculty. And this would be required to be completed and again, that's the vaccination series if you take the Pfizer or Moderna on or before December 1st. And so that again is scheduled for the September Board of Regents meeting. And I believe it's um, the last agenda item on the agenda. 
And then finally, as you come back to class and you begin this fall semester, just wanted to remind you of just a couple of housekeeping items. Again, we, re we are required to wear face coverings within any of our internal spaces on our campuses, on our sites and in locations. This is anticipated to be continued through the fall 2021 semester, and that has been an important designation by and a request of our faculty. And then also we just want to remind you again, please use the um, CSN mobile safety app to just do that daily health assessment prior to coming to campus. And again, if you're not feeling well, please don't come to campus. And then finally, just one last reminder is just again, any of these um, conditions related to COVID-19, such as testing positive, you've undergone and are uh, waiting for a result. If you've had a close contact, if you are ill, and may have uh, COVID-19 related symptoms, or if you were on campus with some, some symptoms and later left because you weren't feeling well, and then as well as you, if you've been a close contact or have been requested to quarantine by the Southern Nevada Health District, please go into wellness at csn.edu. That will help us to also help um, you with any other uh, resources that might be needed through human resources and for your students, we definitely want to provide assistance for them as well. Our goal is always first and foremost to keep our campus healthy and safe. And with that, I'm going to turn it to Dr. Bill Dial. Bill? Hi, thanks, Patty, and thank you everyone for joining uh, this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to provide a few uh, human resources updates. I'm sure there'll be some questions later on <clears throat> in the presentation, but um, there have been receiving human resources, a lot of questions that relates to uh, mandatory testing. Mandatory testing, as outlined by the governor's bulletin, will be required of all state employees. Right now, we are working uh, collaboratively with NSHE to um, outline those logistics and how that will work. Uh, and then when we have that and we have more detail, I will be sending a communication um, to the campus, probably look for that early next week. And so uh, again, just really be looking for that. It'll be a communication from me and please read that. Um, until that time though, th at this point, there's not a reason to necessarily provide human resources with your proof of vaccination. Those instructions will be forthcoming. Um, and so look for that. And then lastly, um, I just want to give a brief update on our telecommuting. Uh, it, it continues to be rolled out with success. We, we have several employees who have taken advantage of hybrid scheduling and so uh, I, I encourage you to continue to talk and work with your supervisors on that. Um, it's just been a real win I believe for our employees and so I did want to update just a little bit though uh, as it relates to OTS. If you are telecommuting uh, you really need to visit with them uh, with OTS. You will be only issued one device um, and per the telecommuting policy there won't be other things uh, uh, issued such as hot spots or things like that and so uh, I did just want to mention that but just wanted to just give the group and, and, and our CSN family some updates from HR and, and I'm sure we'll be able to answer some questions so with that Brian I'll turn it right back over to you. Thank you so much Bill. Yeah, we are going to now go to the question and answer portion of uh, the town hall. And I will pull out our first question, which is, I would like to, uh, to request a modification to my approved telecommute days. What are the steps that I need to take to request the, the adjustment? Perfect. And all you would really need to do in that is, is just uh, work with your supervisor, revise the form, uh, and then have that uh, signed off on and delivered to human resources. Yeah. Excuse me. How will vaccination cards be uploaded, tracked, and verified? I can answer that, Brian, from a from a human resources standpoint. Um, if you can remember when you first came to work for CSN, the, the I-9 uh, process and what that was like when you had to provide documentation, it will be the same um, for, for uh, the, the verification uh, of, of vaccination cards. It will be 
confidential between the employee uh, and human resources. Um, we're working out some of those logistics still, and when I have those really pinpointed down, I will be sending out a detailed communication on that so, so folks understand what, what that will be. But uh, kind of remember back to when you first came to work at CSN and had to complete the I-9 process. It'll be highly similar to that. Thank you so much. The telecommuting request has been out for 36 days. Student Affairs has been told we could not turn it in, and when we do it, can only be submitted for what the upper administration is willing to consider. This completely goes against the entire intention of having the policy and shows it is not up to the supervisor. In addition, the excuses for denial have nothing to do with anything outlined in the policy. As employees, we have done our part. At what point is CSN going to follow through on their work? Yeah, and I think I can maybe uh, jump in a little bit on that. Um, I, I have not been uh, relayed any specific circumstances or, or instances to that. And so um, as part of that and as part of the policy, uh, if telecommuting is denied, um, remember, there has to be a meeting per the policy between the supervisor and the second level supervisor as to the denial and human resources could play a consultative role, but uh, no, no, no instances have been brought to human resources attention of as far as blanket denial. Uh, and so I would ask if, if you have those uh, HR can play a consultative role. Uh, thank you so much for that, Bill. Will CSN help with getting booster shots? Yeah, so thank you for that question and we absolutely will. So one of the things that you saw at the top of the town hall is also the um, vaccination locations that we have currently today at both Charleston and the North Las Vegas campus. I will also, I'm really happy to announce that um, effective Tuesday, August the 31st, we will also be deploying the, the vaccinations here at the Henderson campus as well. So we will have options and availability of all of our vaccinations um, with whichever dose is necessary for those that re will require a booster. Again, I know that part of that is through the evaluation process at this time, um, but it is recommended that eight months after you've received your second dose. So many of our um, early uh, vaccinating individuals are starting to probably get theirs just right here in September. And so please look for more information. And then again, I just wanna remind everyone, we've had a great team are led by Sherry Lindsay, Laura Martin, and our nursing and our EMS students that also provided vaccinations, and we're hoping to also engage them as appropriate as well. Thank you, Patty. According to the Sawgrass report, CSN needed to hire a chief diversity officer to do the diversity, equity, and inclusion work. However, in your address on Monday, it was announced that a consultant would be hired to implement the recommendations. Why is CSN hiring a consultation to do this work? To do this work. Thank you, Brian. That, that's a wonderful question, and, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to kind of to clarify, uh, more so to amplify on, on the um, announcements uh, that we made regarding the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion component. If you all recall, I prefaced my remarks by saying that the um, uh, imperative would be under the leadership uh, of our chief uh, executive, our chief diversity officer, Lawrence Weekly. So I, I want to make sure that, that, that it's clear that no, he's not getting a pass, okay? Secondly, and probably equally important, it's the work that needs to be done. And some of the work that needs to be done uh, is gonna be more of the technical nurture, uh, nature. If you saw the Sawgrass report, uh, they were talking about kind of the data, the data analysis, and, and, and those deeper dives uh, that require specialized expertise. And it's very common uh, across the country in these diversity areas uh, to bring in specialists uh, in the field to help us uh, kind of mine the information that we need moving forward. And then the third area that I mentioned in the report is that many times when we're looking at the institutional effectiveness uh, uh, in the area of diversity, you want to bring in a third party component to make sure that the data is being vetted objectively. So again, uh, I just wanna affirm that uh, uh, the work is continuing within the spirit of the Saltgrass report and we're moving forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Saragosa. 
Why is it only unvaccinated people getting tested when fully vaccinated people can be positive and can spread it as well? So everyone should get tested for the safety of everyone. So, so thank you for that question. And I, I do want to preface this by saying that we also know that those individuals that um, have been fully vaccinated, the likelihood of being hospitalized and or um, succumbing to uh, death is much greatly reduced. We have also experienced, unfortunately, a trend in Nevada where we don't have a high rate of, of fully vaccinated individuals. And so the likelihood of somebody that's fully vaccinated again becoming extremely ill is greatly reduced. We do know that individuals still could also um, become positive, but again, that likelihood is greatly reduced. The symptoms are significantly lower and so again, we really look to the health and safety and encouraging individuals to get fully vaccinated so that we can get on the other side of COVID as a whole. Thank you. You're muted, Brian, you're, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Advisors were called to a meeting with executive leadership last week. However, they didn't receive a detailed plan of the changes, nor were their questions answered. Will the VP of Student Affairs follow up with them to provide the plan as this area reports to you? The answer to the question is yes. Uh, there was a discussion this morning with executive leadership with regard to uh, the multi-campus migration. And we uh, discussed sending communication out to the advising uh, team in particular, and also to shared governance uh, stakeholders. But the answer to the question is yes, and there is actually a meeting on calendar uh, for that purpose. So I do appreciate the question, and your questions and concerns will be responded to in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Juanita. What is the form that administrative faculty can submit can submit to meet the telecommuting policy. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And, and uh, I guess my camera is not working well or something today that people can't see my face, which is really too bad because I know everyone on the town hall really likes to see me. And so, uh, but but actually in all seriousness, um, the, 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 the telecommuting form is two part. There's a request to telecommute and a telecommuting agreement. Um, those were in the actual embedded in the, the telecommuting policy itself. Uh, those were sent to um, AFA and also uh, faculty sent leadership. But if you need that again, please contact HR. We can send you those forms uh, and, and we'll be glad to get those to you. So you'll, you'll have that. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Bill. There seems to be an increased number of reports of retaliation from associate vice presidents and vice presidents particularly after these town hall meetings. Can you please tell us what the process is to formally report their experiences and what does HR do to hold leadership accountable for their actions? Well, so I appreciate that, Brian, and, and, and I want everyone on this town hall to hear me that, that, that HR uh, and CSN takes retaliation very seriously. And, and so I want that to be known very clearly. Um, there does not have to be a very highly formal or, or form or something that, that needs to be filled out. Uh, if you believe you're experiencing retaliation, that can be as simple as an email to Dr. Armin Ashirian, to me and human resources. And, and then we go through uh, an initial inquiry process. Um, but as far as the accountability piece, you know, many times we have to evaluate, is there retaliation or are there other uh, matters going on and sometimes there are situations that uh, we refer that over to our ombuds office um, because sometimes it may be a communication issue and not truly retaliation but also be very clear that retaliation is prohibited uh, under the NC handbook and it's also uh, prohibited, under, uh, prohibited under law and so if you believe you're experiencing retaliation because you've engaged uh, in a protected activity um, it's as simple as sending an email or making a phone call there does not have to be a highly formalized process so um, I hope that answers that question. Thank you so much Bill. Why make mandatory vaccines for students and staff at a future date when the Delta crisis is in unfolding currently and for the near future. 
It's bolting the barn door on after the horses have left. You know what? That's a very great question. I'm really glad that somebody asked that because we've had a lot of questions about what's taking so long to make these changes. So first and foremost, we know that when the State Board of Health took action, um, there is a process that we have to go through. One, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just a one dose, it's a multiple dose that needs to be facilitated. And we know that fall is right upon us. And so again, um, there's also that date that looks at November 1st, which is coming up very fast for students in order to register for the spring semester. But again, we have to give that time um, for those individuals to receive their vaccinations. And we also needed to make sure that we don't disrupt their learning experiences and their progression towards completion and graduation. For staff, we also have to go through a number of processes and steps as the one I mentioned and Dr. Zaragoza mentioned as well, going to the Board of Regents um, for NSHE employees is that first step. There will be, um, as I mentioned also, uh, what's included in the language right now, a discussion and a possible action of that emergency um, amendment to various policies and procedures, including the code, including the handbook, as well as the procedures and guidelines manual. The, any revision to the code does take multiple readings and it does take two readings. And so that would also come back in a final um, consideration at a special Board of Regents meeting. So we also need to be mindful that we give people the time to complete that process. And again, people have a choice of which of those vaccines that they would like to have. Pfizer does take two vaccinations, the first dose followed by a second dose 21 days later, and then Moderna is a second dose up to 28 days later. So we need to make sure that we give them the time to go through whichever vaccine they think is most appropriate for them. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Patty. The multi-campus model has been discussed for many years, yet CSN executive leadership has not provided solid updates, including organizational charts to the campus community. When will a detailed plan be provided, specifically in terms of what is happening with student affairs as hinted in your convocation address? Again, thank you for the question. And if I could, again, I'll amplify uh, on my uh, observations and comments that I made at convocation. And probably uh, I want to remind us that, um, you know, a migration to a multi-campus structure is a complicated uh, uh, process. Uh, and it's also a process that we have to be very cognizant of because we have to do it right. There are uh, accreditation considerations, uh, there's financial aid considerations. So this has to be done right. Uh, and, and so there was a, a, a process that from day one was put in place and that I talked about in the uh, uh, convocation speech. And the first one was obviously the, the establishment of need. Uh, and that was done uh, by that report. Uh, I believe it was a multi-campus uh, 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 committee report uh, that talked about, yeah, it's time uh, to move into a multi-campus structure because we're becoming too large and our uh, results are not what they need to be, especially from the student perspective. So that kind of started the, 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 the phases, if you will, uh, that we keep talking about and, and we've been providing information that are appropriate to the phases. Uh, and, and if you remember, the first phase was a pilot uh, and that pilot was really to take the, uh, the recommendations that were embedded in the original report and apply them. And, and, and we started basically with the foundation that we had at, at the Henderson campus uh, to begin to, to, to at least uh, frame what this would look like in North Las Vegas uh, and at the Charleston campus. And we did have a, a vice president uh, slash provost that was assigned up to that function. That was Patty Charlton. The, the, the next phase, if you will, of that pilot was to build the capacity of the matrix. And we hired two additional provosts. Uh, uh, and, and so now we have the infrastructure. And the goal of you know, the second uh, uh, phase was to begin to align those services so that we could actually enter the third phase. And so the, the second phase was much more alignment and matrix. So collaboration and coordination strategies versus the phase that we're in now, 
which is a migration, which is more the reorganization now and realignment and repositioning of functions. And absolutely correct. One of the major focuses of the uh, multi campus structure uh, was to improve the student experience, uh, which really puts a lot of the focus on student affairs. And, and I'm just very pleased to report that, uh, you know, we're now to the point because it is the appropriate phase uh, to push out a lot more of the organizational function responsibilities. And in fact, that was uh, the meeting that Juanita was alluding to. Uh, we have a lot of information. We've got a structure it so that we can get it out and format it in the right way. So that's where we're at now. We're now uh, in the next 90 days. Uh, we're now beginning to position it so that we get the right information out. But the good news is we're already structured. Uh, again, we used the last year uh, to begin that matrix migration. So we already have a decentralized infrastructure. And now it's really putting a little more beef on that and providing and responding to questions that people might have questions such as this. So the answer is well, probably within the next two to three weeks, you'll be getting a lot of the deeper dive information, including uh, functional organizational structures uh, that you can look at. And throughout the uh, uh, fall semester, uh, we will be having a lot of opportunity, not only to hear about, but also to start getting feedback appropriately uh, by the impacted components. Uh, and again, I think I mentioned very specifically in convocation, what components would be impacted in the transition. I hope this helps. I imagine that it does. Thank you, Dr. Saragosa. Uh, the next question I think will go to uh, Dr. Bill Dial. If the vaccine is mandated, will CSN be taking liability for any illness, injuries, or deaths? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I'm going to take a, a little bit of, a, of an attempt at this, understanding that I'm not going to give legal type of advice on this call, but also understand that the board, as well as general counsel, will be reviewing those type of questions very carefully as they review the policy. And so uh, I'm certain that uh, during the board meeting, there will be opportunities to uh, give uh, uh, opinions or ask questions such as this. But, um, you know, at this point, that would be more of a legal question that will, I'm sure be uh, considered uh, by the board and council. Thank you so much, Bill. Does the vaccination mandate include future booster shots? You know, Patty, I think maybe you and I can tag team that. I have not seen that the actual uh, board item and I don't know that it addresses booster shots, so I, I'm not certain that I have an answer to that. Uh, there may be an issue with Patty, so I, I'm going to uh, go ahead and um, we'll move on to the next question and um, uh, maybe we can uh, move back to this if there's more comments to go. The next question, what steps do we take if our department is not processing our request to telecommute after the request was submitted over a month ago? We were told we had to wait until a specific date, which has come and gone, and then nothing has been processed. Yeah, so I can jump in on that, Brian, and, and um, I'm kind of pondering this question because a department does not process telecommuting agreements. Telecommuting agreements are, are individual agreements between a supervisor uh, and, and their employee, so it's not a department. Um, and again, so I'm not certain even when, when the question says that we were told that they had to wait. I think if there was a person told that they would have to wait, I would encourage that employee to continue to hold conversations with their supervisors and have an update on that because the process itself is not meant to be long and onerous. It, it's meant to be a collaborative conversation um, that is transparent and open and, and serving both the well-being of the workflow of the office, our students, but also the employee. So, um, and again, that is where HR can play a consultative role. Uh, if you wanna reach out to, to, to me uh, or HR, we can probably help on that. Uh, thank you, Bill. If vaccinations are required for employees, will there be a religious exemption, just like for students? Yes, there would be. And under uh, guidance given by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, a, a religious exemption uh, is related to, and, and there will be a process for that, but a religious exemption is a result of a sincerely held religious belief. And um, you would work through that process much like you would or similar to the interactive process under the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, under Title VII. Thank you so much. 
if we are mandating the COVID-19 vaccination, why don't we go ahead and mandate the annual flu and pneumonia vaccinations too? Uh, this may be a, a patty question, so um, I think we are still experiencing some difficulty. Is uh, Bill, is there anything yeah, you can and, comment and on this? Brian, maybe I can and jump in, and, and I think if I'm understanding the question is why don't we mandate X, Y, or Z? And, and um, I think those are questions that can be reflected upon and asked, but for the here and the now, we're focusing on the situation at hand, which is our is our COVID environment, the pandemic environment, and then at a future date, if there are uh, other policy questions, um, then those could probably be reflected on and go through the policy making process, um, much like all other policy. When will the recipients of awards at the 2020 convocation get their plaques? I believe that's probably you also, Bill. It is, and um, so the uh, all you need to do when you have your plaques, just email Jennifer Cross um, and uh, uh, ask her, and you can make make arrange for a time to come to Human Resources on the uh, West Charleston campus, and uh, we probably will eventually too um, deliver some of those out to the Henderson campus and the North Las Vegas campus, so folks don't have to come here. So uh, we can arrange for that, but just contact HR, and we really want to give everyone their their well deserved awards. Thank you so much. The next question, is there any concern with the latest NSHE vaccination mandate that enrollment might drop off for the spring 2022 semester? I remember Dr. Z mentioning enrollment was down during convocation and wondered if that was a concern. That's a wonderful question again, uh, Brian. And uh, if I could uh, just clarify, uh, I believe the point I made is that we we turned the corner. Uh, we've been able to uh, go from a 12 percent enrollment decline to about a 10 percent. We're between nine and 10 percent uh, as of last week enrollment increase. So uh, we're very pleased that our SEM efforts, which uh, again, student enrollment management and all of the initiatives that I've been mentioning are paying dividends. In fact, we're one of the few uh, community colleges across the country and uh, probably the only with an ENSHE that is reporting these kind of, uh, of student gains. Uh, but having said that, uh, we really do not know uh, what the impact of the vaccine is gonna be, uh, uh, the mandatory vaccine is gonna be this spring. And uh, you know we're, we're, we, we've been listening to our students, and we know that it's going to be an imp it's it will impact uh, you know some of the students that have indicated that they would uh, in fact opt out. Uh, but at the same rate nationally, you have students opting in. So we're hoping uh, at the end of the day that we can continue the momentum. We're going to be working very very diligently uh, on our student enrollment processes to continue uh, to make it easy for students to enter our programs and to enroll and to become part of the CSN uh, student body. Uh, so again, at the end of the day, while we do expect that it's going to impact some students, we also know that it's going to encourage some others as well. So that's that's kind of the game plan, and uh, we're very diligently trying to continue to, to have our growth momentum continue this spring uh, in spite of what may, some students might take a, 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 as a opt-out option if the uh, vaccines are in fact mandatory, which they will be beginning the spring semester. Hey, Dr. Zaragoza and Brian, I am so sorry, but my computer locked up, but I'm back. I'm back. Great. <laughs> We're glad to, glad to hear that. Thank you so much. It's great to hear that, Patty. So uh, we're heading into our next question. Uh, why didn't we get COLA this year? The cost of living has greatly increased and the federal government sent Nevada a lot of money to help with the budget. So I can uh, take a stab at that question. So the Nevada State Legislature appropriates our COLA and um, in the last session they, they did appropriate COLA for FY23, but not FY22. Thank you so much, Mary Kay. I'm a faculty member teaching an in-person class. If I or one of my students tests positive for COVID, what is the procedure? Do I put my class online temporarily? If so, for how long? 
Thank you for that question. And again, during the um, the presentation, I did give some some wellness at CSN.edu information. And so what we do want to know first is obviously either if you as a faculty member teaching in person or even a student within your class um, test positive or symptomatic, we want to have that information. And again, it's a confidential uh, reporting protocol through wellness at CSN.edu and our case managers will immediately get on um, getting more information about the specific circumstances so that we can help you to recognize if that class needs to pivot, if people have to quarantine for how long, and some of that is based on whether or not they're fully vaccinated and even includes a, a certain provision of time that people can also uh, get, get tested if they're not symptomatic. Um, but again, we've got a very comprehensive process and we have a lot of experience in this right now, so we please want to have you report through wellness at CSN.edu. And then James McCoy, would you please jump in and just kind of talk a little bit about the flexibility of our different teaching modalities and how we um, can be prepared at the start of the semester for these types of instances? Yeah, you bet. Following uh, your remarks there, Patty, I think there's a couple of things that we're working on, in fact, right now. One is the ability uh, to we use the words pivot, right? Pivot the learning modality uh, into that online space. We're also working on a high flex modality right now. I mentioned this in my academic affairs welcome back on Monday and certainly during my school visits uh, with the academic faculty on Tuesday. So this is a scenario where we can uh, still leverage the facilities in a classroom with a faculty member, but we can deploy in synchronous fashion, sort of live interactive real, real time, uh, the instruction from that classroom uh, to the students uh, wherever they may be quarantining, for example. So we'll look for that high flex modality uh, coming out uh, here shortly uh, within the, probably the last eight weeks uh, of, this, of the fall semester as the infrastructure is being built out right now. Uh, and then we're going to pilot with much greater steam with, with intentionality and with purpose, this high flex modality uh, in the spring semester. And so far we've got about 25 or so faculty who have uh, raised their hands saying, yes, I'd like to try this high flex modality out on purpose. Uh, they'll receive professional development and training throughout the fall semester uh, so we can deploy that, that modality um, in a good size pilot in the spring. We'll learn from that experience and then we'll, we'll probably um, make any uh, you know, continuous improvement exercise to that. And by fall 2022, we should be in a really good place uh, to allow High Flex to be one of our standing regular uh, learning modality options. Another tool in our toolkit, like we would have in person, hybrid, or, or fully online. The High Flex model uh, would be a, a great option for folks. Thanks for that question. Thank you for the information on that. Our next question Has the August 30th deadline to be fully vaccinated or tested weekly? been moved to a future date? Yes, yeah, so, uh, Brian, just, just as a reminder, there, there, there's not a deadline to be fully vaccinated. The deadline was for testing for those that were unvaccinated. And so the 30 de 30th deadline has not been moved. We are looking at a possible grace period. Again, that will be in my communication to the campus next week. So uh, I appreciate that question though. And again, more, more to come. What if a student in an in-person class is exposed? Thank you for that. And again, um, we really want you to, to work with our wellness at CSN.edu and exposure may happen in different locations. It could happen somewhere outside of uh, the college environment. Um, also, depending on the type of program that they might be in, it could happen also um, on campus. And so what we want a student to do is really to contact us at wellness at csn.edu. And I want to just also say that our, our case management team works very closely with our faculty. They have been absolutely um, fantastic with working on specific instances and circumstances. But then also um, as needed, we also work with the registrar's office and Bernadette Lopez Garrett has been a great um, resource for us as well. So we want to make sure that that reporting is done so that we can provide all of those services that might be needed to assist our students. And so again, please just utilize the wellness at csn.edu so that we can really unbandle that specific circumstance. Thank you for that, Patty. If we are lecturing and not close to the students, can we take off our masks? 
No, you cannot. At this time, we have a face covering requirement that is inclusive of all of our internal spaces. Uh, we do want to ask you to, if you have any special needs, there's a couple of things that we have done. We've got some uh, unique face coverings that we purchased for some of our specific programs, uh, communications, um, our American Sign Language, and some of our language courses, just um, by example, and also with some of our music programs. But no, we cannot have you remove your face covering at any time. And also, James McCoy and his office is working on um, some resources along with OTS for those that might need a microphone um, when they're in an in-person lecture. And so, James, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yes, yeah, certainly, uh, Patty. Thank you for acknowledging that. We uh, we put the request out to faculty who are delivering in-person instruction uh, where those face coverings are required if they needed some amplification support. And, and faculty uh, rose their hand in groves. In fact, I'm looking at the sign-up list right now. Uh, 256 faculty so far have signed up with the request for one of these personal microphones. It comes with a, a personal speaker as well and tested, uh, tested a sample out just earlier this week and I think it's going to be marvelous. Uh, those microphones are on order. We expect them to arrive any day now. The minute they arrive, uh, my office will be coordinating with the 20 academic department offices uh, to deploy these microphones to the department office so that the department office uh, folks can, can get them to the faculty who have requested them. Uh, if you're not on that list and you'd like to be, please contact your department chair uh, and your administrative assistant in, the, in your department. Uh, they know how to access the request list and we'll make sure to get your name on there as well. Thanks for that question. And thanks for that answer. Uh, this is probably for Bill Dial. If an employee is also taking classes, will proof of vaccination be submitted twice? Probably not. No, I mean, and as we look at how we're going to track this information, it will be pulled and, 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 and each person will have one record. And so that way it will keep uh, and avoid us having to do that, that double, that double uh, coding or, or double submission. That uh, sounds good. Thank you very much. I often have online students who want to meet with me in person in my office hours and or use the library in person or use in person tutorial services. Starting in spring 2022, will unvaccinated fully online students still be able to use CSN's in person services or will those be considered off limits to them? So that's a really great question. And I will say that, um, as I mentioned, uh, this, these new requirements were just passed on August the 20th. And so at this time, we are looking at the registration and the, the course taking modality and the vaccination status. Yeah. Um, that does not preclude that we would not need to have students um, continue to notify us of any potential exposure and we don't anticipate that our wellness and our case management will be going away and so our services are available and we know they're such an important part of the success of a student but yes they would still be able to have access and um, again we're going to work through this and we're going to work through this together and so thank you for that and i will tell you that's part of our faqs that we are working through as well and so i saw james has his camera on so james jump on in please yeah, you bet. I just wanted to affirm some of the academic support services that are available fully online for students. Uh, so if a student is taking their full course load online, no doubt they should be able to receive academic support services online as well, wherever they are in this world and whatever the circumstances might be regarding the pandemic. And so to that end, our, our Centers for Academic Success, for example, under Shelley Keller's leadership have done a, an incredible job of meeting students where they are in the learning modality that they need to be. That includes fully online interactive synchronous tutoring, uh, both through the Centers of Academic Success, as well as through uh, smart thinking that we've always had uh, up and running even pre-pandemic. Uh, our library uh, uh, faculty and staff have also done an incredible job throughout the last 20 months or so uh, with standing up uh, virtual library services so that essentially every service that would, uh, would be available for a student uh, in the library physically is available uh, through outreach um, uh, via virtually as well. So my thanks to Emily King and, and, and her team uh, for that work. And then finally for faculty, particularly for students who uh, have a desire, of course, to meet with faculty during office hours, I want to remind faculty that the learning modality of your instruction can mirror uh, the learning or probably the office hour modality of your office hour delivery. In other words, if you're teaching 80% of your classes uh, online, then expect your 
good portion of your office hours can be done in a synchronous way virtually as well again to allow for students to meet you uh, where they are within their within their learning preferences and so in this environment uh, where you know we've got circumstances with vaccination requirements and to what to what extent um, are they still be able to access services regardless of vaccination status I think we're in a really good place given the, the work that's been happening over the last uh, year and a half or so. Thank you for that. Many of us noticed unmasked individuals at convocation on Monday. How is this rule being enforced? Now, uh, thank you for that question, and that that is quite disappointing, I know, um, to see that. And so I know that um, I, I do believe that it still is all of our responsibility to enforce. Uh, convocation was just on Monday, and so one of the things that we do know is that we're going to be working with supervisors on assisting us on that enforcement, but it is a priority, it is a requirement, and we are mandated by the state of Nevada and executive governance governor um, order and so um, if you see those circumstances please feel to report it if you're not comfortable reminding someone sometimes they've taken a drink or they might have had a snack and they forgot to put it back up if you're not comfortable then by all means perhaps um, reach out to one of us i know clarissa's on this call today as well um, i know we walk around our campuses um, quite a bit and we want to make sure that people feel safe but that that, that mandatory mask is not an option it is mandatory so um, please just let us know and then we can also work with human resources to assist people if it's an employee. Thank you so much for that, Patty. When will the student unions be fully open and operational? <laughs> OK, yes, we're so excited to have um, everything starting to open up on August 30th. So um, everyone coming to the campuses, you should be seeing our student unions open. Uh, we will have our coffee services and, ca and the coffee cafes open and available. So um, we've been gearing up for August 30th, start of the semester, including the student unions. Thank you for that information. Are booster shots going to be required next? You know what, right now um, we're working through the process of the mandatory vaccination, but um, it, it could be something that's recommended. I know there were some questions when I was losing connectivity regarding what about the flu shot and others, but at this time we're focused on um, the fully vaccinated two dose regimen, if it's Pfizer or Moderna, and then also the J&J. &J. Um, I know that there's a question out there also for the November 1st and the registration, is it the two weeks post? No, it's just um, documentation because again, we're focused on having that completed in time for the registration, but this new policy will be effective um, for the spring 22 semester. And also please know it's not just our credit based students, it's also our international students that are here on campus as well as our non credit students as well. Thanks. Many HR functions are completed by department AAs. Will these AAs have to take part in the tracking of COVID-19 vaccines and testing? No, that, that will only be it'll only be HR just due to the nature of you know many of what our administrative assistants do are, are with personnel type of payroll transactions and employment verification. But anything to do with um, uh, th this sort of uh, vaccine and testing sort of tracking, I'm sorry, testing tracking because we're not at the vaccine yet will be strictly done by those individuals who are under the HR department due to the confidentiality and the confidential nature of that data. My vaccination status is already showing as verified from WebIZ integration under my Workday profile. Will I also need to upload my vaccination card? No, you will not. And that's these are part of the logistics we're working through. So uh, uh, we're doing some work in Workday on that. And so uh, again, uh, and I hate to sound like a broken record, this very detailed information will be coming from me, but you would not need to upload any further information. Terrific. How will documentation be checked for falsified vaccine information? We have been informed some students are devising means to provide false information so as not to be vaccinated. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm going to ask Bill and um, Juanita to also uh, kind of join in on this response. So one of the things that we are working on, not just CSN, but really across um, NCHI and or our Southern Nevada institutions is to work with the um, 
some organizations that actually help to certify and to validate um, those processes. So again, from an employee perspective, um, that is HR and Bill has done a great deal of work, um, you know, since this initial um, announcement was made. And to the point that we can for those that received their vaccination within the state of Nevada, um, the access to WebIZ has been um, working through that process. And we've got a, gr a lot of information as we just heard that um, I think somebody says that their, their, uh, their record has been updated. On the student side, this is a new process. And so again, we'll be working with Juanita Crescento um, Lisa De Jesus, as well as the registrar on those processes to validate and certify, because we do know that the concern regarding falsified records is a serious one. And it, it does also, it is criminal. And so people, um, I think it's a misdemeanor and or uh, would be subject to a fine and, and some charges. So Juanita or Bill, did you want to add to that? Patty, I would say you, you covered that pretty comprehensively and it is a new process for student affairs. The college registrars are discussing this across uh, INCHI system and uh, the, the notion of someone falsifying the records, uh, it's something that we are working collaboratively as a team. Uh, Adam Garcia is involved in considerations of that as well as legal counsel. And so uh, it's just one of those things that we have a short timeline. We intend to comply 100% with the uh, requirements and the guidance that we're getting from INSHI. And uh, September 30th is the timeline that we've been given to uh, to have our process in place for students. And Juanita and Patty, I think you guys both answered it perfectly. Uh, you know, there, we are looking at, again, those uh, type of third parties that can certify um, those uh, that documentation. Um, so I think you both answered that perfectly. Uh, before I, I, I ask uh, the last question, I just want to let everyone know that we have received a very, very large number of questions in most cases, um, unless something needed to be uh, reviewed for, for understanding. Uh, questions are asked in order and all unasked questions are advanced to the um, panel once the uh, once the questions are closed so that uh, they can you know look at them and and answer back as appropriate so uh, for those who haven't had their question asked just understand that many many questions come in and in the time format we have we can't get to them all so our last question is for uh, uh, Magunt, our CIO. During the convocation address, it was very hard to hear if you were listening virtually. When you clicked on captioning, it was not accurate and or was not an option. Why wasn't closed captioning available? Thank you, Brian. Um, CS and family, thank you for asking this question. Um, as you all know, this was uh, supposed to be face to face and then we moved to hybrid uh, format. So we were trying, our, our, the team was trying to do our level best to give the same experience that people are watching live versus virtually. Uh, yes, there were sometimes some uh, teams uh, had some uh, audio issues in between. Um, and uh, we were trying to do this as a big celebration. As you all know, it's our 50th launch with, with very, 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 very under um, budget that typically we spend over in the, uh, in the past years. Um, what we're going to do is going to review what needs to be done and we're trying to make sure that uh, all the uh, event recordings are uploaded by next week and also uh, we put the closed captioning as much as possible. Uh, yeah, we some suggested they had some closed captioning issues, some suggested the audio concerns. Uh, we were trying to fix it as much as possible since this was a live event um, with multiple cameras with TriCaster. So, so thank you for your feedback and we'll make sure that as we go, moving forward for the next big event because this was the first big hybrid event internally we did. So appreciate it and we'll make sure we'll fix it. Thank you, Brian. So that was our last question um, and now we'll turn things back over to Dr. Saragosa to close. Thank you, Brian. And again, let me thank all of you for joining us uh, this week for yet another opportunity to discuss COVID and campus development uh, updates. 
I, as always, I hope that you found the information useful. Uh, and as is evidenced by what we discussed today, um, we're entering a new phase in our battle against the COVID pandemic. Uh, and together we're making great progress uh, to get back to a new normality. Uh, please know that your work is essential. Uh, it is valued and I deeply appreciate the sacrifices that all of us make during this difficult period. But finally, let me remind you to please join us for as many of our upcoming 50th anniversary events as your schedule allows. God bless you, stay safe and see you at our next town hall. Adios.